The gargoyle king roars with all the might of his throat, crossing both of his swords. Sharp teeth are ready to tear apart three people who dared to come out against him. Shelly looks at his 30th level with fear. This is much higher than they expected, and therefore they were not ready for this at all. However, Shelly can't afford to back down. She is not at all the type of person who gives up in front of obstacles, once you see them. Frank gives Schultz the order that she should attack after him, and he himself will act first, to which Shelly readily nods. Frey says that you can't drag out a fight with an opponent whose level is an order of magnitude higher than your own. In such situations, you should act quickly. He clutches the weapon in his hands, putting his mana into it. A man attacks the Gargoyle King using his Cutting Wave skill. The monster reflects the blow without any problems, which, however, Frey expected. But this provides an opportunity for a new attack, because it has opened. The commander raises his sword over his head, intending to strike again with the hope that at least this time it will work. But even this had no effect, there is a flash from the clash of weapons, and Frank sees that he could not even scratch him properly. The rough skin of the king remained intact, as it was. Then Shelly enters the fight, who has only been waiting for this opportunity. She runs at him without showing a drop of fear, although the monster's level is high. But it's not that fast, so she has every chance of winning. Besides, Schultz has no equal in sword fighting. Her skill Princess of the Sword at times increases her talent for fencing. The king has reopened, and the girl hits him with a sharp swing of the sword. One more flash and it is visible, and this action did not have a result. Shelly had such a strange, cringing feeling, as if she hadn't done any damage to him at all, although the girl had definitely walked a blade through his body. Now it's Guido's turn to attack. His arrow flies straight at the king. The sharp arrowhead shatters against the monster's skin, as if it was made of glass, not iron. Gilland, drenched in cold sweat, realizes that he has no chance as well as the rest of the team. Arrows are useless against the king. Frank, breathing heavily from such rapid attacks from both sides, analyzes their chances of winning and comes to a disappointing conclusion. The monster has a high defense index, but low speed, and yet this monster is generally too tough for them. It is simply impossible to inflict damage with a sword or arrows due to high protection. And if so, then damage can only be done by hitting the eyeballs. The monster is not going to wait for the opponents to gather their strength. He swings a huge sword and hits the team commander hard. Frey can hardly stand it, clenching his teeth until his jaw aches, forcing himself to think in the meantime how to get out of this deplorable situation. The commander is trying to force himself to think, because if he does not come up with anything, not only will they not leave this dungeon with nothing, Having coped with overpopulation, they will not leave here at all with their heads on their shoulders. The monster's greedy eyes stop on Frank and then the floor under the two of them begins to glow red. Frey stands with his feet right on the star, which is enclosed in a perfectly even circle. The man himself seems very low compared to the king. Frank, after this star lit up under him, realizes with panic that the king also owns magic, which, of course, does not bring joy in such a deplorable situation. The monster uses his fire roar skill, and a fire vortex surrounds his huge body. With a scarlet flame, he throws Frank back a few meters. Rising from the ground, Frey clamps the wound on his arm. The sleeves of his clothes are half burned, and the skin is bleeding. Balls of steam come out of the mouth. He looks over his shoulder at his colleague. Judging by the appearance, Shelly is fine, but she is clearly losing confidence in her own abilities with every second. There is less and less time to get out of the underworld alive. Frank tightens his grip on the sword in his hand. If now he, as a leader, shows weakness, lets them see that they cannot win this battle, then they will all be finished. There is no way to retreat now. The fighter cuts through the air again with the cutting wave skill, leaving the space to sparkle with blue light. There may not be another chance to attack, so Frey decides to act now. Frank fearlessly jumps straight into the flames, not afraid to die. Shelly opens her mouth, shouting after him that did he really decide to use what she was thinking about. The monster roars with rage. Frey uses his strongest blow on him, decapitation, after which a very small number of monsters remained alive. The man's sword cuts through the air with blue lightning, and the flame eats up his air around him. Turning back for a moment, he orders Guido to start the attack right now. The young man quickly pulls the arrow. He can't help but shout that the commander is doing everything extremely recklessly. Nevertheless, the arrow flies out of the bowstring, dissecting the space with a green light. It hits the center of the king's blue eye, which is located in the middle of the gargoyle's belly and which he seems to have deliberately opened as much as possible. Frank lands neatly on the ground, glad that they were finally able to fully attack. It remains to deliver the last, decisive blow, and then it will be possible to celebrate the victory. 
but it was too early to relax. The commander's eyes cling to the king's movements. The monster turns out to be dissatisfied with the fact that he was still able to injure. He strikes red magic directly at a man who is trying to defend himself with a sword. The king manages to knock the handle out of his fingers, and Frank tumbles to the ground. The commander's body no longer moves, and although he does not move, he still continues to breathe, which is good news. Guido, realizing the plight of the bottom, orders the girl to forget about their leader and immediately run away. Above Frey stands the king, who is going to finally deal with his defeated opponent. However, Shelley is not going to back down so easily, much less abandon her loyal colleague. She boldly stands between the monster and Frank. Schultz seems like a bug in front of such a formidable opponent. Guido looks at the girl with annoyance, dissatisfied with her act and scolding her for how stubborn she is. He puts an arrow in the string. After a while, Shelly is still standing in front of the king, but now she is on her knees. Blood runs down her face, and she leans on her sword to keep from falling from fatigue. Behind her, Guido lies motionless. His arrows have fallen out of his quiver, and the bow lies slightly in front of the owner who clearly recently fell out of his hands. Breathing heavily, she realizes that even though she couldn't stop Frey from that reckless attack that almost cost him his life, so now she can't leave him to die here. Shelly clenches her teeth tightly. She should have run earlier, now it's too late for a shameful retreat. She apologizes to Guido, who is the only one among them who initially did not want to go for this monster. Gilland, beaten, lies on the ground, but slightly raises himself on his elbows to answer and asks the girl not to talk such nonsense. He closes his eyes, the guy is not going to blame anyone for this. In the end, Guido himself made the decision to fight, and therefore the girl should not bear the heavy burden of guilt at all. The guy loses consciousness and it is not clear whether he died or just breathes too weakly. Schultz looks at him in amazement. She is grateful to him for having her back, even though he may not have liked her very much. The king raises his hand to kill the last opponent, and Shelley no longer rushes into battle with her head, realizing that she can no longer do anything without anyone's help. All she has to do is close her eyes and accept defeat along with a heavy blow from the gargoyle. Someone behind her picks up Frank's sword. But time passes, and Schultz is still alive. She timidly opens her eyes, not understanding why it happened. In front of her is Chrome, who says he can't afford to just stand and watch these people die. He holds the sword by the hilt and by the blade, stopping the monster's blow, and clenching his teeth tightly from how strong he is. Mimic shouts that he is now the opponent of this stone bastard. He won't let these guys fight alone anymore. There are bruises and abrasions on Schultz's face, but she does not pay attention to them, and her arm is also injured, judging by the way she holds onto it. Shelley recognizes the guy with the mask they met earlier. It even turns out that Guido is still conscious, albeit with difficulty, but he raises his head to ask why he came for them. Chrome remembers with a sigh and a slight dissatisfaction why he did this. Before coming here, the guy was sitting on the floor of the cave, head downcast, and realized that it was too risky to follow the team. They will very quickly realize that he is a monster, one of those whom adventurers kill every day. If they recognize him, they'll have to fight three at once, and they didn't seem like bad people. But Chrome doesn't let his doubts consume him. What is he even thinking about? The guy abruptly rises from the floor. It is not about what is right, but about the fact that Chrome himself wants to do as he wishes. After all, this is the reason why Mimic wanted to become an adventurer, that in his past life, that in this one, the desire to save other people moved him all his life, but fate did not give Chrome any useful talent or skill. The guy dreamed of fighting monsters and protecting innocent people. Shelley, Guido and Frank are risking their own lives to save a million others. Why, then, should Chrome act like a coward and abandon them? The guy is able to help them and at the same time not become a heavy burden. He rushes in the direction in which the team disappeared in order to have time to help them. Chrome's thoughts go back to the Gargoyle King in front of him. Although the mimic wounded him, but their difference in levels is simply colossal, it is not surprising that the team could not defeat them, even with experience in battles behind them. While the monster has the 30th level, Chrome has only the 21st. The amount of mana of the king is 44 units, and the guy has only 23, despite the fact that he uses it for the skill reincarnation. Barely holding the king's sword with his own, the guy curses and eventually retreats, almost falling on his back. He realizes that he will definitely not be able to cope alone, but is it possible to expect help from the wounded Guido and Shelley? It would be better to escape right now, but again, the conditions of all three leave much to be desired. Frank Chrome may inform, but he will not have enough strength for Schultz and Gilland. The actions of people still did not leave the monster unscathed. They wounded his head and eye on his stomach, 
which is also the weak point of the monster. Like the fighters before him, Chrome understands that the weakest point of the monster is the organ of vision on the stomach, which is not covered by anything. The king hits the mimic right in the chest, causing him to step back again, almost falling, and the monster seems to grin, pleased with his own attack. Then Scarlet Blood sprays in all directions from the wound on the Mimic's chest. Shelly screams that such a wound is fatal, and Guido wonders how he is still standing on his feet. Chrome's eyes light up green, indicating that he is using one of his skills. The gargoyle roars with rage, seeing that the enemy is still on his feet and is not going to give up. And it's true, Chrome swings his weapon and says that even though he was distracted, he is stronger than it seems at first glance. He's aiming for the blue eye. The king brandishes his weapons, as if not seeing the mimic in front of him. While the monster is about to launch a counterattack, Chrome uses regeneration to heal a deep wound on his chest. The mimic has a very strong body, and with such regeneration it is simply impossible to kill him. The guy calls the bully for the second round, standing in a fighting stance. The king, apparently realizing that the enemy's weapons cannot penetrate, uses a fiery roar, as he did in the fight with Frank. The mimic squints, he has put fire magic on himself, then. Chrome jumps away from the fire, not letting himself be hurt, but regretfully realizes that if everything goes on like this, he will not get to the king in any way. The monster lowers his sword on the fighter, shattering the stone floor, but the guy manages to jump aside. Immediately realizing that the idea was extremely disastrous, it turns out the mimic is in a dead end, from where it is no longer possible to hide somewhere. Chrome's eyes reflect how the opponent raises the sword. He won't be able to dodge it. Shelly looks at this scene with a sinking heart. She can't help the mimic, and even if she could, in any case she has already lost to the gargoyle. Now the chrome will come to an end. A purple flash flashes. However, the expected does not happen. The monster is buzzing with irritation. His sword is held by grey hands with long black claws, which do not belong to the person Chrome turned into. The king exhales fire from his nostrils. Chrome's gaze burns red, and he cheekily asks if the king really thought he was done with him. The guy even grins at how pleased he is with himself. It was a very successful move on the part of the mimic. The opponent has opened his belly, from which Frank's sword now sticks out, and with his other hand he continues to hold the king's weapon. The monster roars furiously. Shelly can't believe that such a frail-looking guy managed not only to stop the attack, but also to wound the same eye on his stomach. The girl does not understand who this man is. Where does such a superpower come from? The flames begin to surround both the monster and the guy, hiding in a scarlet whirlpool. The monster's fire reaches the hand that holds the sword, and Chrome winces at how hot it is. A sharp tip, engulfed in fire, tends to hit the enemy. Mimic picks up his weapon and dodges to the side. Unfortunately, the gargoyle was not as simple as it might have seemed at first. He inflicted a mortal wound on the king, and he is still able to fight, although purple blood flows from the wound. Dodging again, he realizes that he can't attack him back. With a new attack, Chrome runs away to the side and takes time for a short-term respite. Thanks to regeneration, he was able to overcome the fire curtain without being hurt, but he can't carry out a retaliatory strike because his mana is almost at zero. There are only five units left out of the 20, eight maximum, and the level is not even comparable to the level of the monster, the 21st, while the gargoyle has the 30th. The difference, it would seem, is small, but it's too much for a mimic. Things are getting worse and worse, it's just disgusting. Not only can Chrome no longer use regeneration, so at this rate, reincarnation will also become impossible to use, because mana will end earlier and then Shelly and Guido will see his true face, which of course is not good. However, it is impossible not to notice that the stone idiot, like the mimic, is at the limit of his capabilities. Now the question is, which of them will run out of steam first? A bright flame envelops the monster's body. Chrome clenches his teeth tightly, feeling the warmth of the fire. Because of this coating, he cannot get closer to him. If the mimic reincarnates into his true form, it will only scare those guys with whom he definitely does not want to deal but not the enemy in front of him. Stalemate. The earth is shaking from the powerful step of the king. Chrome really has nowhere to retreat this time. Shelly is trying to get up from her knees to the side. She forces her body to move on the mere thought that if the girl does nothing, then their savior will die. Guido reaches for the bow lying not far from him and grabs it tightly. He shoots an arrow and orders this guy not to even think about dying here, because he hates being in debt to someone. The arrow flies past the mimic, and he does not even understand where it is flying, because it does not get close to the monster. Looking closer, Chrome sees that the arrow hits the stone ceiling, which needs very little to fall on other people's heads. A huge boulder falls right on top of the king's head. 
Mimic mentally praises Guido for a great blow, because he hit right on the head. This is a great chance to kill such a strong opponent. Chrome thrusts the sword deeper than last time into the eye on his stomach, so that now he will surely hit the monster. He jumps back as a wall of flames surrounds the king. Purple blood spurts from the wound. Although the weak spot has been attacked twice, the gargoyle continues to stand on its feet. It is worth attacking him exactly at the moment when the monster is vulnerable, but because of that strong attack, Chrome dropped the sword, which now lies under the monster's feet. There's nothing to be done, you'll have to go into battle with bare hands, which the guy has, compared to ordinary human ones, are grey, and the nails on his palms are long and sharp. He jumps into the flames and screams that this bastard is about to come to an end, and then punches him in the eye. The green glow overlaps the red one coming from the monster. The mimic stands over the defeated and realizes that he has emerged victorious. He defeated the dungeon boss of the 30th level. Such a victory was expensive. The system message says that 630 points were received by Chrome. The level has been upgraded from 21 to 25. In this world, dungeons are places with evil magical energy that attract a bunch of monsters. Such spaces also create wonderful habitats for monsters. The boss of the dungeon is the very first monster that settled in the depths of the underworld and became a kind of source of huge magical energy for the rest of the evil spirits. Now, thanks to Chrome and the team, the boss is crushed, overpopulation will stop for a while. The hierarchy among the monsters with the loss of the leader will change significantly, which will take some time, and everything will thus return to normal. The last question remains, did Guido and Shelly see Chrome's partial conversion during his fight with the gargoyle? Perhaps they did, considering Guido's suspicious gaze, which burns his back with his eyes. Jillan reflects on what happened. There is no doubt that this guy saved them all, while they, trained adventurers, could not deal with the dungeon boss. He did not just kill the king, but defeated him alone even managed to deliver the final decisive blow with his bare hands. Who is Chrome? From where does it have such power? With all this, the stranger's physique is quite fragile, his arms and legs are thin. Chrome is happy about how well he raised the level thanks to this battle, and even saved the guys from seemingly imminent death. It just turned out great. Now it remains to raise the level exactly in half, from 25 to 50. The guy became one step closer to the stage of a new evolution among monsters. Shelly approaches. She thanks Chrome from the bottom of her heart for saving her, because without him they would definitely not have coped and died an inglorious death. The girl calls her name and smiles sweetly. The guy hurriedly removes the information window so that Schultz does not see that his race is not human at all. Shelly asks to introduce herself in response. Chrome seems to be panicking even more. His mana is almost at zero. A little more time, and he will turn back into a monster, having lost all human appearance. His skill reincarnation temporarily allows you to take human form. Consumes one mana unit in 10 minutes. Chrome, meanwhile, has only two mana divisions left, which is only enough for 20 minutes. You need to take it now, otherwise it will be too late later. Shelly tries to touch the stranger's shoulder to find out the name after all, but Chrome does a very stupid, but in his situation the only right thing, rushes away. Everything is very bad. It is no longer possible to keep in shape, and Shelly definitely should not see him in this form. Schultz looks sadly after him. He ran away again. Guido also looks at the fleeing back of the fugitive. In his opinion, this type is extremely strange. The guy approaches the monster's corpse and says that the stranger didn't even collect the monster from the boss. The king's eye is proof that overpopulation in the dungeon has been stopped. For such a mission, you could get a whole lot of money. Shelly is delighted with this man. He did not take the award and did not even give his name. How humble is this person? Guido is more skeptical about what is happening. He hardly believes that there are such fools in the world. However, Guido cares the least about why the guy didn't take the award. He is most concerned about the question of why the stranger was here all alone, and how he was able to heal those fatal wounds. Could it be that the dungeons have such an effect on him? Suddenly Frank gets up from the ground on trembling legs, who immediately says with a sneer that Guido, as usual, thinks too much. The guy is amazed that the commander is still alive. Frey replies that this stranger didn't leave them in trouble and save their lives without asking for something in return, so there's no point in looking for some ulterior motive. Guido doubtfully agrees with the commander. Frey's sword is still sticking out of the king's eye, all stained with purple blood. Guido grabs the hilt of the sword with both hands and sits down on his knees to pull out the eye. Frank asks the subordinate to take his time and take out, as carefully as possible, in the end, a valuable and most importantly expensive artifact. Shelley still doubts that they should do this, because they did not defeat the gargoyle. 
Frank has a different opinion. They need the organ as proof that this dungeon is no longer dangerous. He promises that if they meet that guy again, we will give him the reward we received from the guild. Shelly wonders if they will meet again, and is already eager to meet again. Somewhere deep in the dungeon, Chrome rests his hand on his knee to catch his breath. A little more and I would have been caught. The guy was walking right on the edge. Chrome may have lasted a little longer, but the frequent use of such a skill as regeneration spent a decent amount of mana. The good news is that at the 25th level, the Mimic has 36 mana points. Chrome sits down on a rock, already with a mask on his face. If reincarnation spends one unit in 10 minutes, then you can hold out for even more than 6 hours. With the right calculation, it should take half a day to recover half of the mana. If so, Chrome can secure a shelter with people in the village. Somewhere far away, a sleeping Carme in a dream thinks about where her stupid brother has gone. Mimic gathers his strength. You need to try to get out of this dungeon in order to test his theory. Clouds float over the kingdom of Leyberg. In the Adventurer's Guild, people are vying to ask each other if it's true that Frank, Guido and Shelley have dealt with the overpopulation of monsters in a dungeon in the west. Others are amazed that these three defeated even a monster, although everyone knows how strong these creatures are. Frey can't help but smile, even though he's trying to smile less obviously. Shelley has a confused and even sad face, she is clearly still thinking about the escaped Chrome. And Guido, as usual, is just not happy with everything that is happening. Frank skillfully talks about how they killed this monster. He says that everything he told is true, the man has never seen a boss of such a high level. However, if it weren't for the three of them, the western dungeon would quickly turn into a nest of monsters that would come out and attack civilians. Guildmaster Hands appears, whose long grey beard testifies to the wisdom of years. The old man wears round glasses on his nose. He notices that he can hardly believe that only three adventurers were able to defeat the boss of the underworld, who surpassed their level. Fran easily admits that there were not three of them at all, the master was not mistaken here. Hans frowns, not understanding what he is talking about. He asks what he means. Shelley steps forward, waving her hands, happily begins to tell that what Frank said is true. In the dungeon they met a boy who helped them defeat the boss. Hans tilts his head a little to one side in perplexity, and, frankly, looks at her as if she is crazy. Does this girl want to tell him that thanks to the help of some boy they were able to defeat the dungeon boss? The master turns away from Shelly, thinking that she must have been in the dungeon for too long and her mind was clouded by the magical miasma. Schultz turns out to be outraged by this assumption. She shouts that this is the purest truth and pokes her fingers into her eyes, describing that stranger. He had grey-haired hair with pale skin, and his gaze was menacing. A smiling mask hung on his head. Shelly says she's not lying. She saw it all with her own eyes. Guido inserts his word that a colleague is overpraising him too much. As far as he remembered, that guy's gaze was lifeless in fact. The aura around him was just creepy. His cheeks were sunken, as if he was being starved, and his skin was pale and painful. Gillen grumbles about how she overpraises him. But Shelly says that, on the contrary, Guido belittles the merits of their savior. Frank interrupts their argument. He admits that Schultz describes him too colorfully, but without this guy they would not have come out of this dungeon alive. Hans says he can't believe such words. In the end, it really looks like a fairy tale. Some unidentified kid appeared, helped kill the boss of the underworld himself and disappeared into the sunset. Then Frank provides his most important proof. No one talks about blind faith in their stories, because they brought the eye of the gargoyle king. This is a weighty argument, isn't it? He proudly shows a pouch that glows red and it is immediately clear that a dangerous high-level artifact lies in it. Other people from the guild are amazed at their find. A strong magical energy emanates from the bag in which the eye lies. It also proves that some white-haired boy really helped the team and didn't even take the reward for it. For the most part, the guild members are outraged. It was impossible to defeat such a boss and not pick up the reward is complete nonsense. Why would a person just take and give up a bunch of money? There are whispers that maybe he's just a village fool who didn't know at all that you can get money from such cases or just likes to wave his fists for nothing. Shelley goes into dreams that, probably, he is a bodyguard from some royal family who wandered into the dungeon in order to hone his skills on local monsters, which are like small bugs for him. That guy looked like a man from a noble family, definitely not just a commoner. Frank grumbles that his colleague was dreaming too much, looking at her very, very skeptically. Frey scratches his head, he feels guilty that now, because of his unsuccessful story. Everyone thinks of him as a village fool, that he didn't even think to take the award. 
a man mentally apologizes to a stranger for this state of affairs. In the crowd, a black-haired girl who heard the whole story concludes that this guy must be an incredibly experienced fighter, so he defeated a boss of this level. The western dungeon is the place where her girlfriend's brother was last seen. Carme takes the dagger out of its sheath and reads the inscription wait for me. The girl hides the dagger and puts her hand on the sheath, as if afraid that it will be stolen. In the western dungeon, not only did her brother disappear, but it is also the place where an unknown person saved her life from a ferocious ogre. Since the boss is defeated, now the hierarchy of the dungeon will change. The monsters will weaken, and that underground world will no longer pose a strong threat. At least a few years should pass before the birth of a new boss. Now the dungeon will be much safer than before, and she will be able to go in search of her brother again. She clutches her weapon in her hands, determined to go in search of him in the near future. Carme missed her brother so much. Frank, having received a reward from the guild, lifts a bag of gold into the air and says that it was worth risking his life for such a mountain of coins. Guido overshadows his joy. In his usual manner, he grumbles that half of all this will go to the treatment of wounds, the purchase of new weapons and armor, as well as rental plans. Was it really worth it? Shelly is still worried about the stranger. She presses her palm to her mouth and excitedly asks, what will they do with that boy's share? Frank shrugs his shoulders and reminds that he ran away himself. No one chased him, thereby refusing the reward. Before saying goodbye, they need to first divide this mountain of gold into three. The commander gives the coins to Guido, ordering them to be divided between the three of them. When Shelly gets her share, Frank puts another small bag on top of what she earned, much to the girl's surprise. With round eyes, she asks why he also gave this money. Guido looks with displeasure at the overly violent reaction of a colleague. Frank, laughing, puts his hands on his belt and reminds her that she kind of wanted to return to her homeland. He becomes serious and says that the path will not be easy, so let the girl be as careful as possible. Schultz, hardly holding the bags of gold in his hands, bows low to him and thanks him for such a mercy. She happily promises that she will definitely thank the commander tenfold. Frey takes her at her word. Shelly waves to her colleagues one last time, and then leaves, happily heading back home. Frank stands with a wide smile on his lips and waves back, but Guido does not try to portray joy for the girl or sadness because of the breakup. In fact, he does not even look at her, not going to give out his true emotions and thoughts on this score. When Shelly is no longer around, he says that the money given by the commander was a donation that Frank received from the church, as an orphan who lost his parents during a monster raid. Guido asks if Frey thinks he's wasting this money. If Shelly found out about such a situation, she would definitely scold the commander for showing such stupidity. Having lost his fun, Frank says that every year the number of overpopulated dungeons increases significantly. Scientists agree that in hundreds of years their kingdom, where peaceful people now live, will turn into a huge nest of monsters and there will be no more peace here. Therefore, donations are worth nothing to him. No matter how hard the adventurers try, clearing the dungeons from monsters and helping poor orphans who suffered from the attack of evil spirits, everything ultimately comes down to one thing. Addressing Guido, Frank calls people fools by nature. They will always do meaningless things. Even Guido did that when he didn't throw them to the monster. Gilland asks if he even knows where Shelly went. He answers his own question, to a city that has suffered from overpopulation of monsters. The ruined city of Otfield. Guido thinks that Schultz should forget about this godforsaken place, but she still returns there time after time. Chrome, still in the dungeon, kills some kind of monster. The system reports that 36 points have been credited to his account for this murder. The guy spent the whole day clearing the dungeon of the remaining monsters in the hope of raising his level a little. However, this did not help him at all. The 25th level out of 50 possible levels was still written in the information window. There are few monsters left in the dungeon, since no new ones are born after the death of the boss. In a couple of days, groups of hundreds of adventurers will descend here for ingredients from the corpses of monsters. There's no point in Chrome staying here anymore. He already searched the entire dungeon for monsters in order to increase his level before going out to the village to the people. However, with the current level, even taking into account the fact that he was clearing the dungeon to increase mana, in order to use reincarnation, it is impossible for Lame to enter the city. His original goal is to return to the kingdom's capital to Carme. However, there are too many people there for a low, level monster like him. Besides, because of the darkness of the underworld, the guy could hide his sharp fangs and huge bruises on his face. Such a trick will not work in the capital. If this happens, then where is it better for Chrome to settle? 
In Chrome's memoirs, Ash says that he won't go into Otfield, even if the guy forgets about it. Ash will not go there for any promised money, because going to this place is like death. The interlocutor, Chrome still in its former guise, asks why this place is so bad, since he receives such negative reviews from residents. The man in response almost roars and asks that is this guy joking? Is he completely unaware of the situation in that city? After the monster attack, Otfield turned into a real ghost town. Even if there are sudden monster raids, riots, robberies, expanses and murders, everyone will still not care about his fate. No one in their right mind would ever come into this rotten little town. This memory pops up in the mimic's head for a reason. Lawlessness reigns in that city, so his appearance will not cause many questions. He will turn into a human with the help of reincarnation, and during the day he will wear a cloak with a hood to hide his fangs and too obvious pale complexion. These protective measures should be enough. Chrome can stay at a hotel upon arrival and restore his mana behind closed doors of the room in order to become a human again. Also, thanks to the ingredients that Chrome managed to collect from the corpses of monsters, he will be able to earn a little extra in Otfield. This money is even enough for food and housing. The idea seems just brilliant. The guy gets out of the dungeon and gets under the sun's rays. His next stop is the town of Otfield. The streets look desolate and what is most terrible, it's like a hurricane has passed through them. The walls are cracked, fallen pieces of stones and wooden beams are lying at the foot of the house. Chrome, having turned into a man, muses aloud about the destroyed city of Otfield, through the streets of which he is now walking. This is a place that became a haven for all kinds of scum of society after the attack of monsters from the dungeon, as far as the guy remembers. There are dark rumors that this is the most dangerous city in their country, but people continue to live here, as Chrome may notice, and they don't even look like life-hardened robbers or murderers. Nevertheless, the mimic feels happy. Even though he found himself in such a gloomy place, thanks to the reincarnation he was able to go out to people and no one looks at him askance. However, caution will never be superfluous. First you should buy closed clothes and stop smiling broadly, otherwise the fangs may notice. Now Chrome is able to maintain his human appearance skill for about six hours. Before he turns into a monster with a mask again, he needs to find a cheap hotel where he can easily restore mana at night. And yet, the first thing Chrome puts on his list of tasks is to look at the guild headquarters. Already approaching the guild, he puts on the counter red stones of monsters above the 20th level, as many as three pieces. A man from the guild looks doubtfully at what he brought and does not hold back from asking how the guy got them. Even at first glance, he is flimsy and skinny, there are no muscles at all. But what can we say about the equipment? Chrome laughs awkwardly in response and replies that it's all thanks to his incredible skill. The stones that Chrome brought are gargoyle eyes collected from the western dungeon. For them, he can get enough money to live in the city for a while. The heavy hand of a man to dump 500 gold pieces on the table. Chrome opens his eyes. This is not the reward he was hoping for, not at all. This employee must be joking. They will pay 10 times more for such ingredients in the capital, and they will thank you finally. The man says to go to the capital in this case. He reminds the guy's indignation that they are not in the capital, but in a god-forsaken place called Otfield. Maybe these stones were stolen at all. How would the employee know? The employee says that in this guild headquarters they do not check the level and rank of the adventurer, and also no one cares which way the guy got these stones, whether this one was legal or not at all. Even if Chrome showed up here completely covered in blood, no one would ask any questions and wouldn't even look crooked, frankly. If the mimic is not satisfied with something, then let him fail on all four sides and look for a buyer who will pay him more and ask much more reasonable questions. Chrome decides to leave with 500 coins, but this does not mean that he has accepted defeat. He was simply cheated. This money is enough at best for three days, at worst, for an even shorter period. In addition, Mimic does not know the local rules, so he cannot trade here either. The path of Chrome is blocked by a tall blonde man, who immediately recognizes him as a newcomer. When a guy asks what this man wants, he introduces himself as Jeff, a local adventurer whom every rat in town knows. He reports that the newcomers here are being devoured by the guts, so it would be better for Lame to learn the local rules as soon as possible. The guy had never heard of any rules in Otfield. He wonders if he can trust Jeff in this matter. The adventurer grabs Chrome by the thin fabric of a black rag on his chest and slams it into the wall to make his dominance more convincing. Chrome did not expect that after a couple of minutes of arrival in the city, he would be treated like this. Jeff demands to give money for the stones, which the guy probably stole in his opinion, and he, so be it, will cover his back in Otfield. The guy is outraged, this adventurer is also going to blackmail him. 
What other people will be waiting for in this missing place? Grabbing the hand restraining him, Chrome replies that he does not need someone else's protection services at all. Jeff says that such a weakling will not last long in Otfield, but Mimic does not let him finish his speech. He roughly pushes the attacker away from him, and he falls to the ground like a potato that has fallen out of a bag. Jeff asks how he dared to do this. Acquaintances behind the adventurer's back immediately begin to tease him. Their handsome Jeff could not cope with a walking skeleton. Apparently, he slipped right on the hard asphalt. Chrome, meanwhile, roughly determines Jeff's level, if he considered it correctly, then about the 20th. The man jumps up from the asphalt and shouts that this asshole is now going to answer for everything. He draws a silver sword from its scabbard. Chrome hesitates. Is he seriously going to attack a guy with a gun surrounded by a bunch of witnesses right now? Yes, it does not fit into any framework. Jeff's friends ask him to cool down, the situation is really not suitable for a fight. But the adventurer does not seem to hear their arguments. He is enraged by Chrome's trick and promises to teach the kid a proper lesson. It is at this moment that the guy decides to act, running up to Jeff and the people who held him. The mimic kicks the sword hilt out of the adventurer's hands. While Jeff looks at the discarded weapon, even more angry at the boy, he realizes that it's time to get out of here before it's too late. Jeff shouts after him that next time he will definitely kill Chrome and nothing will save him. The mimic stops in an alley. He would have been able to defeat Jeff, but he would not want to waste mana, which is needed for reincarnation like oxygen. In this scenario, his disguise will be quickly revealed. Apparently, it will be much more difficult to live among people than in the dungeon from which Chrome got out. Later, sitting in a room rented with the proceeds, the guy sits on the bed in the guise of a monster and realizes that even in the underworld he was not so tired. Eventually, he was able to pay for a hotel, buy a sword and a cloak. Only now there was a feeling that someone had already used things before him. According to the system, the rusty dagger was stolen and sold. Chrome himself bought it for 240 gold. The old robe was also stolen, bought by Mimics for 60 coins. Finally, a room in the hotel was rented for 110 gold. Chrome managed to find the cheapest and simplest room in order to restore mana overnight. The guy bows his head heavily, sitting on the edge of the bed. Chrome would like to spend some more time among people, since only monsters surrounded him in the dungeon. However, you will have to collect information about this city, and then go down to the underworld again to continue hunting. Thanks to his skill, which spends a little mana, Chrome was still able to settle among people and spend some time with them. Meanwhile, in the church, the Holy Father asks Shelly if she is sure that it is worth giving them so much money. A young girl could spend it on her own needs, so it's not worth it. Schultz smiles all over his mouth and holds a small child in his arms. She assures that the Holy Father does not have to worry. The adventurer will definitely earn even more money as soon as she returns to the capital. Although they are grateful to Shelley for the donation, however, she still shouldn't have spent so much on them. The Holy Father sadly says that Schultz should forget about this city as a terrible memory, which is not worth it. Shelley asks what the Elder is talking about. She will never forget this place. After the monster attack, it was the man who raised her in this very church. The girl is surrounded by children, whom she calls her brothers and sisters, and Shelley has to take care of them. Some boy asks if it is true that she is a famous adventurer in the capital. Schultz replies that naturally his sister is one of the coolest adventurers. The boy naively asks whether the capital will help them deal with the disaster hole. Shelly opens her eyes, but quickly finds an answer. She says that her brother can be sure that they will definitely deal with this. She says goodbye to the Holy Father and asks him to take care of himself. The man asks the same from her, because her job is much more dangerous than his. Chrome was never able to talk to anyone. As soon as he tries to start a dialogue with someone, they look at him as the last idiot. Maybe it's worth picking up more stones from monsters and selling them in the capital, where the guy will really get a decent profit from them. But this option is immediately discarded. It's too risky, there are a lot of guards around the capital. And Chrome will spend too much money just to get there. There are people sitting in the alleys of Otfield, poor and destitute. But they don't seem to get out of the general landscape of the city in any way. The guy walks among them and doesn't even notice. He reflects that in the capital he will be caught quickly if he seems suspicious. This is where he can walk, and no one will look at him askance, everyone here is so. Strange. In addition, in the center of the country, Chrome may encounter old acquaintances with whom he would definitely not be eager to cross paths. For example, with Ash, who remembers how he died then in the dungeon. But Chrome won't make a lot of money in Otfield either. Mimic does not notice, but Shelley comes to meet him, who immediately recognizes him as the boy who saved them near the capital. Chrome freezes with an unreadable expression. Schultz shouts that this is the same boy. 
The guy opens his mouth. What did the girl forget in this hole? Shelly is literally beaming with joy at this meeting. She asks if he remembers her. Without waiting for an answer, Sama says that they met in a cave. Chrome heroically saved her and her comrades from the Gargoyle King. She could not have imagined that they would meet so soon. Chrome does not say this, but he thinks that he, as it were, did not plan to see her. As far as Mimic remembers, her name is Shelly Schultz. In that squad of Frank, Guido and her, Schultz had the lowest level. The 18th, as far as Chrome can remember. However, the question still remains, what is she doing here? Those guys don't give the impression of dangerous criminals. They must have come from the capital. Then why? Chrome understands that if he stands there and remains silent, he will cause even more suspicion than the two times when the Mimic escaped. But the guy intends to escape this time as soon as possible. Shelly is trying to find out his name again, since he never called him then. Chrome turns around and, shouting that the girl has made a mistake, rushes away. Shelly stands behind with her eyes round with surprise. She asks him to stop, remembering Frank's words that he has a lot of questions for this stranger, because he may very well be an escaped criminal. Shelly realizes that Frey may be partly right that he could be an ordinary criminal, because this explains the boys stay here in Otfield. And yet Schultz could hardly believe it. She's too kind a person for that. She rushes after him, saying that she is not going to dig into the guy's past. Shelly says on the run that she would just like to thank him for saving her, that's all. Chrome doesn't seem to hear her, he doesn't understand why this girl is chasing him. Had she guessed his true identity? Chrome's affairs are getting worse and worse. Schultz stops in the middle of the street and tries to catch his breath. She had lost sight of the supposed one. Although she is fast, however, the stranger turned out to be much faster than her, an experienced adventurer. Shelly is at a crossroads, which way to turn? Which way did Chrome turn? But the guy has a problem with being in a dead end. However, there are some advantages, there is no she Shelly or anyone else nearby. But everything led to the fact that she would catch him. In such a situation, you will have to use the claws of a mimic in order to break away from Shelly, hiding behind the wall that Chrome rested against when he was running away from the girl. He clings to the wall with his long claws and begins to climb up. There is very little left until the end of the barrier. The hand is already clinging to the edge, when suddenly Chrome's sword falls to the asphalt. The guy doesn't want to part with it. He paid 240 gold pieces for it, which, by the way, don't just lie around on the road. Chrome breaks away from the wall and jumps after him. However, the landing does not turn out to be soft. He rubs his lower back and scolds himself for such a reckless act. What kind of normal person jumps from the height from which he jumped? Chrome doesn't notice Shelly, who stands over him in shock and asks from what height, as the guy says, he jumped. Cold sweat begins to drain from the mimic. He's in trouble for the full program. Chrome manages to get up, and Shelly begins to apologize. She chased after him and apparently scared him, although she didn't want it at all. The guy asks not to take such nonsense into his head. He himself began to run away from her. After all, it turns out that Chrome heard her saying that she was not going to dig into his past and reminds about these loud statements. Schultz readily replies that this is all true. She doesn't care what he's done in the past. What matters is that he saved their comrades and herself in the Western Dungeon. Chrome still looks doubtfully at the new acquaintance. He was afraid to meet with his acquaintances, as they would be able to see him as a monster, and not the former man of Chrome. But this girl is the only one of all the locals who wants to talk to him and is ready to close her eyes to who he is. She's so kind to the guy, compared to the rest of the residents of Otfield. Shelly asks for her name for the third time. Although the mimic is a little confused by such a request, he replies that his name is Chrome Clank. Shelly claps her hands and notes that the new acquaintance has a very beautiful name. The guy hopes that he will not regret later that he called himself by his real name, and not by some kind of pseudonym. Chrome says that, as far as he knows, the girl's name is Shelly, right? He can't resist asking what she's doing in the godforsaken city. Seeing Schultz's not-so-obvious reaction to the question, he immediately apologizes. He didn't think when he asked, after all, it's none of his business, so Shelly can leave his question unanswered. Schultz smiles and says that everything is fine, don't let him worry. Turning away, she says that she actually lives in the capital, and comes here to visit relatives from the church because Otfield is the city in which Shelly was born. The girl remembers that every time she visits her family once a year, she notices how the city is becoming more and more dangerous. The moment when Frank said that the girl's hometown was overrun by monsters after overpopulation of the nearby dungeon pops up from her memories. Chrome finally understands why Otfield has become a haven for criminals. That explains a lot. The guy admits that, in fact, he is here for the first time. 
He asks if this city has always been so dangerous. Shelley decides to tell about the times when Otfield was a thriving city. Of course, it would never have been comparable to the capital of their kingdom, but life was boiling and bubbling in it, and the townspeople loved their Otfield with all their soul. But not good without evil, there was a dungeon near the city where overpopulation of monsters was in full swing. In those years, Shelley was still a small child, and local adventurers could not prevent the impending threat. At one point, monster camps formed on the outskirts of the city and on trade roads. Trade gradually languished in Otfield, and all the wealthy people, as well as the nobility, dispersed to other cities, safer and more promising. Eventually, a lot of townspeople left Otfield. They were replaced by criminals who, although they began to protect this city from monsters, however, made it a habitat for thieves and lawlessness. Shelley can't hide the sadness in her head. Criminals, of course, protect local residents, but they do not consider them to be people, forever extorting money from them, which the townspeople do not have much. They are raging, and no one is able to stop them. Shelley seriously declares that she is going to become a first-class adventurer in order to bring peace and quiet to Otfield, reviving their former calm and peace. Chrome breathes out her name in amazement. In the church where Shelley grew up, the boy says that as soon as he becomes an adult, he will also become an adventurer and will defend the city instead of with Shelley's older sister. He proves his words by demonstrating the skill, telling about the fact that he has a useful one. A fireball is going to gather in the palms of the boy. The orphan promises to work hard and give all the money she earns to the church to help her family, including the Holy Father who raises them. The man laughs, Shelley would be touched by his desire to the depths of his soul. Suddenly, the Holy Father hears footsteps and is alarmed. They were not expecting anyone today. The door of their church opens rudely. Enter two tall men, adventurers, if properly considered. The boy asks with interest and naivety who this uncle is who is standing in front of him and so ugly appeared in this quiet place. Jeff, who is the newcomer, says that Otfield knows how to surprise. He could not even think that this church, which was killed in trash, in which only rats fit to live, is still working. The Holy Father is thrown into a cold sweat. These people are undoubtedly representatives of the Red Dragon Gang, which controls the entire city in a tight grip. Jeff quickly reveals the purpose of his visit. It turns out that their gang is getting fewer and fewer workers every day, and Grandpa here, apparently, can help them, because he has a whole bunch of capable kids here. The man reports that they have an order here from the head of the gang himself, which cannot be rejected in any way, and will not work in any case. The Holy Father understands what will happen if he refuses to cooperate with them, right? There is a boy hiding behind the teacher's back, who recently demonstrated his outstanding skill. The boy is trembling with fear, he has never met these people, but when he looks at them, he cannot stop trembling all over his body. The orphan grabs the robe of the Holy Father. The boy chooses the way not to be afraid of them. He has strength, besides, he wanted to become strong, like Shelley's older sister, to fight with the strong and protect the weak. The man who came with Jeff says that children are so troublesome, and the old man copes with them alone. Let him give them all, simplifying his life at times. The Holy Father falls to his knees. He tearfully asks not to involve children in this matter. The man touches the floor with his forehead and says, in this case, take it, if these people so please. Jeff grins. Why is this old man so stupid? They definitely don't need senile people like him and the gang. The Red Dragons desperately need new fighters, whom they will train according to their gangster cannons and from the Holy Father there will only be more problems. An orphan comes forward, who, though with a stutter, seriously declares that he will not allow people dear to him to be bullied, especially the Holy Father. A five-pointed yellow star in the center of the circle lit up on his palm. The churchman asks the boy, Tails, to stop. He does not listen to his guardian and boldly directs his fireball skill at the members of the Red Dragons. Jeff, however, is not a bit scared by such a pathetic attack. Even more, he is inspired by the boy's skill. The interlocutor next to him, at whom Tails was aiming, easily repels the fiery lump with one hand. For a strong man like him, it was too weak. Tails is at a loss. He had hoped that he would somehow help his brothers and sisters, as well as the Holy Father who stood up for them, but his attack did not have the proper effect. The long-haired man says that the boy lacks the skill to use his skill correctly and to the full power of his powers. He decides to demonstrate how it should have been. He calls for exactly the same star as the younger one with the only difference that it has a purple color and burns more brightly. His skill is called Ball Lightning, and the name itself says how useful he is to the gang. The wall, to which the man put his hand, collapses, letting in bright street light. Jeff admires his bro's skill, it's really something with something. The boy steps back, 
in front of these two, he is a complete nothing, too small and weak to fight. Tails realizes he can't beat them. With empty eyes, he falls to his knees, and Jeff says that at last the kid realized the helplessness of his situation. The second gang member stretches out his palm in front of him and promises that in the Red Dragons they will be able to develop his skills to the same level. The little one can stop worrying. The Holy Father realizes that they can kill Tails if they overdo it in their training with him. An iron stick, similar to a poker, stands against a brick wall next to an extinct fireplace. The Holy Father grabs her, he used to fight monsters, and he's still something, yes he can. He pokes a piece of iron into the back of Jeff's partner's head. In response, he receives a blow with a sword, and the collision between the weapons sparkles with a purple flash, which makes the Holy Father doubt his position. Jeff is displeased to know what this madman is doing. The old man asks Tails to run away from here as soon as possible. The boy sitting on the floor looks at his guardian with tears, but this time he listens to him. Through the front door he runs out into the street. Jeff swears and wants to go after the insolent man, but his partner asks him to relax. A gang member says that before catching a child, it is worth teaching the manners of an old man who dared to speak out against them and all the red dragons. Only the burning eyes betray the true emotions of a man, otherwise his face continues to remain emotionless when he swings at the old man with his hand. At the noise, children run out of the room, who excitedly ask the guardian what is going on here. The Holy Father, with pain in his voice and eyes squeezed shut, asks the children, like Tails, to run away from the church. The orphans freeze in confusion. Jeff takes advantage of their appearance, puts a sword to the Holy Father lying face down and threatens that if they move even a step, they will separate the head and body of this person. The partner, holding the old man by the gray hair on the back of his head, presses his face harder into the floor. He says that the more his ball lightning accumulates energy, the more destructive its effect will be. In that case, either he will smear the Holy Father's head, or he will give him these children. And that's the end of it. Only the old man now decides what to do. A palm with a crackling lightning in it is already winding over him. On the streets of the city, Shelly suddenly freezes with her mouth open. The money that Chrome was supposed to get for killing the Gargoyle King. Frank entrusted to her, because Mimic didn't take it anyway. Schultz immediately begins to apologize. She had already given part of it to her family in the church, and Frank and Guido shared the rest of the proceeds. It doesn't become some kind of tragedy for the guy. He still has the money, as long as he has it. He pulls out a half-empty bag of coins and asks to give him 200 gold pieces. He doesn't need more. Shelley says there aren't any, and starts rummaging through her pockets in search of her own wallet. Chrome begins to say that he would be grateful to her for a detailed story about the nearby dungeons in which he is going to hunt to level up. However, he is attracted by a loud childish voice calling his sister Shelly. The girl turns around and sees a tearful Tails, who is breathing heavily from a long run. He stops in front of her, continuing to cry and barely managing to wipe away his tears. Schultz sits on his knees in front of him and excitedly punishes him not to walk the streets alone. It's too unsafe for such a child. The kid does not listen to her and tells her that evil people have come to their church who are going to kill everyone's beloved Holy Father. Shelly gets up from her knees and tells Chrome that she urgently needs to leave. She asks for forgiveness for this. The guy, realizing that they came not so much for the Holy Father as for the children, and decides to go with her. Shelly is his most reliable source of information in Otfield. It would be stupid to lose it so easily because of some bandits. Chrome remembers what it means to cherish family ties, no matter how painful the memories of his own childhood with his younger sister were not given to him. He must repay Shelly for her selfless kindness. The cracked walls of the church become visible. The old man wheezes with back pain when the man applies a fireball to his back, clearly not hesitating to use it with all his might but so as not to kill. Jeff complains about how stubborn the Holy Father is. A terrible-looking wound was formed on the back of the churchman. He steps on his head with the sole of his boot and informs him that he does not want to be a murderer at all, so let him be obedient and finally give up. No one here will be better off from such reckless stubbornness. Jeff asks why the old man needs these useless street kids, whereas they would be much more useful in a gang. Maybe the Holy Father doesn't want to do this because of the priest's own pride. In that case, he's just ridiculous and it's definitely not worth dying for. After such a tirade, Jeff brazenly spits, hitting exactly the forehead of the churchman. Tears of pain are already appearing in the eyes of the Holy Father, but he does not allow them to spill. These people can say whatever they want, but he loved and will love these children with all his heart, who did not deserve to be left without parents, 
and then get to the red dragons, propping himself up on his elbows. The priest says that if he has to undergo these painful tortures to prove his boundless love for them, then so be it. He would never give them into the hands of such thugs to be torn to pieces. Jeff's face twists. How can this old man say such cheeky things to his face? His partner reports that such a meaningless pastime is already beginning to bother him. He asks the children, frozen with fear and horror in the passage of the room, to watch as closely as possible and not take their eyes off how their so-called defender will die the most stupid and pathetic death possible. The man raises his hand above his head, on which the star symbol glows, intending to bring down all his might on the Holy Father. Through a hole in the wall made by the same person, Shelley and Chrome rush in. The guy stands a little ahead and, unlike his girlfriend, does not freeze in shock and horror at the sight of a beaten priest but holds a sword in his hand and rudely asks what these idiots are doing here. Jeff's partner asks not to make noise, because everyone in this city knows that you should not stick your long nose into other people's affairs, especially if it concerns the red dragons. Jeff realizes with suspicion that he has already seen this pale kid somewhere. Shelley also finally understands what kind of people are in front of them, the same gang of red dragons, about which there are just terrible rumors all over the city. The partner says that since Chrome does not know at least the simplest laws of their outfield, he will show him what happens to strangers on their territory, who also stick their noses where they should not. He puts a fireball in front of him in confirmation that no one is going to joke here. The Holy Father weakly whispers Shelley's name. He clearly didn't want a kind girl like her to get into trouble because of him. Jeff finally finds out who is standing in front of him. It's the same brat who ran away with his tail between his legs. He really seemed familiar. Jeff points at him, unable to hide his arrogance. Chrome also remembers this person. It was, of course, none other than the extortionist from the guild, who was the first among others to show all the friendliness of Otfield. Brandishing the sword as if it were a child's toy, Jeff says that there is no one among them who could stop him. Even this coward Chrome is not capable of anything. The long-haired one is sure of it. The Holy Father, still lying on the ground, barely lifts his head to tell the visiting Shelley and the unknown boy to run away from here as fast as they can. He worries about the pupil, whose level does not reach the level of the members of the Red Dragons. These people are too pathetic, but if Schultz gets into a fight with him today, then they will chase her too. Jeff, ignoring the priest's wheezing, laughs from the piece of iron with which Chrome pokes at him, and the guy cared very much about his sword for as much as 240 gold. The man notices that although there is enough courage in his facial expressions, however, he clearly did not come out with a physique. Chrome is clearly fighting for the first time at a time when not only his life is at stake, but also the life of the Holy Father, as well as Shelley. How wrong he is. Terrifying monsters flash before the guy's eyes, with whom he already had the honor to fight for life and death, even the Gargoyle King, thanks to whom he met Shelley. Chrome asks not to be misunderstood, and immediately declares that there has never been a person on his road who would be as weak as Jeff. He raises his eyebrows in surprise. This was not the answer he had hoped for. Chrome attacks first. Jeff, clenching his jaw angrily, can't help but notice that the opponent is fast and surprisingly strong. But the chromium level isn't higher than his own, is it? This simply cannot be. The man refuses to believe in such a probability. Jeff doesn't accept that kind of truth. He swings his sword at the opponent, but before he even has time to strike properly, the mimic touches the tips of the blade to his chest, and a green light surrounds them. Jeff's leg twists, and he settles on the old wooden floor. The man jumped back to weaken the opponent's blow, but it was still close enough to pierce his chest through and impale him as if on a spit for food. Jeff feels his chest to make sure there is no wound. Chrome towers over him. He is trembling only for the reason that he is just terribly angry at this man who behaves more disgusting than any monster. The man throws in a sweat. Now this boy could easily and simply finish him off, and no order from the head of the red dragons would help. DDF notices with horror that he is shaking. How could someone like Mimic scare him? The partner of the long, haired man decides to interrupt the abuse of his friend. Raising his hand to the top, he surrounds them with a purple star. Wall lightning attacks in a furious stream to the place where Chrome stands, and the guy barely manages to jump back. Then, without giving the boy time to rest, the man hurries to strike with a sword. But Chrome quickly recovers, deftly blocks the blow. He says that taking care of Jeff is one thing. But his own attacks are quite another, and since Chrome was able to get rid of several in a row so easily, then he is clearly not as simple as it seems. Still, it wasn't smart of him to fight the Red Dragons for the sake of a broken church and a few kids in it. Chrome is thinking about his own situation. He has already applied his skill and cannot cancel his skill, even in a place like Otfield. 
Besides, this man in front of him is stronger than his human form. Jeff, realizing that the attention of the most formidable opponent here has been switched to himself by his bro, finally gets up. He didn't dare to think that someone could stand up against Rado. However, Jeff gloatingly thinks that now Chrome's back is open. Shelly prevents the murder of a friend. She crosses balls with him, intending to fight until her last breath for the sake of these children. The Holy Father and the Church. Schultz declares that now the man will fight with her. The vein on Jeff's temple swells with anger. Everyone in this room looks down on him, and a man will make them regret it. Sparks fly between Shelly and Jeff's weapons from the hatred with which the rivals attack each other. Schultz can barely keep up with him. Obviously, the bandit's level is higher than her own. He is faster and stronger. Jeff feels it too. He is already anticipating an easy victory over this girl, because compared to Chrome, Shelly is nothing to him. In addition, it is very striking that this is Schultz's first fight with a human. Judging by her clothes, she is an adventurer from the guild, which means that she has only fought monsters up to this point, so the task cannot be easier. The level and experience are on the man's side, he can't lose in any way. Jeff laughs at his rival, does he really see fear on her sweet face? He tells her the same thing he told Chrome a little earlier, is this her first fight with her life on the line? In that case, she is a very naive second-rate adventurer, unworthy of his attention. And Jeff really likes to play with women, did she know about this? So let him not even dare to die too easily. Shelly frowns at such a statement, no one has ever dared to perceive her as a toy. In the battle of Rado and Chrome, the leader is definitely the elder. He admits that the enemy has both a high level and courage, but the metal in his hand could have been taken out to the trash for a long time, and not to fight against such a serious opponent as Rado. The man lowers his weapon, as if he sees in the boy not a rival, but a training partner and asks why he decided to fight with him, because it is natural that in nature the strong should dominate the weak. Chrome thinks they'll just take it, leave here and what will happen then? Nothing will change. Unlike his partner, Rado prefers not to waste energy. He goes on to say that if people like Rado and Jeff fight in full force, they will cause irreparable harm. However, he offers something, Chrome can get out of here and then Rado will close his eyes to his antics. That was his last warning. Surely Chrome is not going to sacrifice his life because of a petty sense of gratitude. The guy asks if he really has to stop because it won't change anything. But throughout his life, Chrome has met such unbearable people as Rado. This is the reason why he did not give up his dream of becoming an adventurer, even though at times this occupation seemed to be complete nonsense. Chrome looks up at the opponent and replies that he will never succumb to the persuasions of someone like him who constantly runs away when the mimic himself has gone so far. Rado hisses that the guy is a complete fool. The elder admits that he never intended to fight to the full in a place like this, however, as a member of the gang of red dragons. He cannot allow such a brat to discredit their honor and dignity. Rado stretches out in front of him and summons lightning into his sword. Chrome has never seen anyone do this, it makes him very much amazed by what he saw. Standing around the blazing lightning, Rado promises to burn it in a few seconds. This will make Chrome regret the choice he made, even if the boy does not even doubt. 